The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Get vaccinated or find another place to work? In some sectors, that question is already on the table, even in a tight labor market. Tonight, we'll examine the mixed picture of vaccine requirements on the job for employers and staff. Then, with the freeze on residential rent increases set to expire in the new year, we'll hear from tenants and landlords about what happens next. It's Monday, October 18th, and that's ahead on The Agenda. As nearly 85% of eligible Ontarians are now fully vaccinated, more employers are expecting their staff to show that they've had the jab. And while a new app might make doing so easier, this may be more complicated than it seems. With us on why, in Port Loring, Ontario, in the district of Parry Sound, there's Charlene Stewart. She's the president of the SEIU Healthcare Union. In the downtown core, Ryan Watkins, employment lawyer and partner at Witten and Lublin. And in Midtown of the provincial capital, Julie Kuczynski. She's Director of Provincial Affairs for the Ontario branch of the CFIB. That's the Canadian Federation of Independent Business. And it's great to have you three with us here on TVO tonight. Ryan, can we just do a couple of definitions here? Because we hear these terms used interchangeably. And I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Vaccine mandates, vaccine passports. Is there a difference between these two things? So a mandate traditionally is set by an employer stating that you have to be vaccinated to work uh, for uh, an employer. Uh, when we're talking about passports, typically we're talking about businesses where there has been a, you know, now we have the, the government has come out with a QR code where to go into an establishment, you have to scan your code. So, you know, like a traditional passport, when you go to the airport, you have to show your passport to get on the flight. Um, that's what we're talking about in terms of vaccines. Gotcha. Okay, Charlene, let me get you in here now because we are starting to see, I think, more and more employers say that if you don't get vaccinated, you may not have a job. I mean, the Toronto Transit Commission, the TTC, suggested the other day that their members have got to get vaccinated or they're fired. How concerned are you about your members being fired if they don't get the jab? Well, uh, Steve, of course, we're concerned about workers uh, for any reason not being at the workplace. Uh, being fired, of course, is going to put an added uh, stress on the workplace. Uh, we don't want to see any healthcare workers obviously um, get ill or die from this uh, virus. We already lost five members, so definitely uh, we support the uh, vaccine mandates. It's about workplace safety. It's about knowing that you're protected, knowing that the person you're working shoulder to shoulder with is protecting you. But again, um, we do obviously have a staffing crisis that we talked about many times on you know your show. So uh, the vaccine is adding to that crisis. But I have to tell you, Steve, uh, it is not the only reason why workers are leaving the workforce and the sector. So absolutely, we're concerned about them um, not being at work and for whatever reason, uh, terminated or, or uh, what is it? It's uh, leave without pay. We need those workers to be at the at the workplace, and we need to find solutions for all of it, not just the vaccine. No, I appreciate that, and, and you're quite right. We have had many discussions on this program about the difficulties that the people who who do the jobs of um, uh, some of the hardest jobs in society. We want to make sure they're on the job. But do you believe it is a reasonable response for an employer to say, particularly in healthcare, you must be vaccinated, or you're out? It's all about keeping people safe. And absolutely, we support keeping the workers safe and healthy and, quite frankly, alive and the people that they care for. SEIU has supported uh, mandatory vaccinations. Our members, close to 80%, do. And they look at it, as I said, as a issue of workplace safety and protecting themselves, uh, their co-workers, and the people that they care for. Okay. Julie, how do small businesses that you represent feel about a vaccine mandate? Well, we surveyed them in August. And it was split. 54% are in favor of vaccinations of employees in the workplace. 34% are against and 12% are undecided. So the challenges are very different for a small business than a larger business. If the government doesn't 
make this law, and we're not suggesting that they do, the vulnerabilities for human rights and legal complaints are higher for small businesses. Although the Human Rights Commission did, sh did come up with a web post on September 22nd saying that you didn't have to accommodate individuals if they choose not to be vaccinated for personal reasons. However, I go back to my earlier point. If the government isn't making it law, small businesses are vulnerable to potential human rights and legal challenges, and they do have challenges with accommodating employees. It's easy for a large business to find accommodations for employees when they have hundreds or thousands of employees, but for a small business that has three to five employees to begin with, how do you make accommodations that are actually allowable? Well, let me follow up with you as well. And, and I'm glad you put that Ontario Human Rights Commission statement on the record there, because yes, the, the commission said, you don't have a right to a job if you don't want to get vaccinated. And if they fire you, I mean, essentially they were saying, don't come to us. So in your view, do you, do you believe that, that uh, employers ought to be allowed to fire employees who refuse to get vaccinated? I don't know if I'd go that far, Steve. As I said, um, we're a grassroots organization and we take our cues from our members. And as I said before, we're very split on this issue. It's extremely divisive. 54% are in favor of employees getting vaccinated in the workplace, 34% against. 12% undecided. That's a majority. It's not a clear majority. So again, again, I go back to the fact that there are different challenges. Already we're facing a labor shortage and that is exacerbated if you are a business that only has three to five employees to begin with. So I can't go that far to say that, Steve, because okay, I we get don't you. have the member data to I get support you. that. Well, Ryan, let me get you in here then. Do, do you believe it is legal for employers to fire employees if they don't get vaccinated? I think that they can. I think when we start with the premise that uh, an employer's job is to keep workers safe, um, having a policy where uh, that their employees have to get vaccinated certainly makes sense. Now, the, the caveat, which we've already uh, discussed, is that uh, if there's a human rights concern, and the only two uh, so far um, that have been uh, credible in terms of in the eyes of the law are if there is a medical exemption, which has been limited, and also a religious exemption. Again, with, re uh, with religion, it's been limited as well. You haven't seen many cases that have been able to uh, make it through the court system successfully. And with that, if an employer does let uh, an employee go, they are entitled to severance. So I don't believe that an employer can let an employee go because they are not vaccinated and not pay them any severance. Hmm. Ryan, do you think employees are somewhat in the driver's seat here, uh, particularly in the service sector, in as much as we're hearing there's a tremendous shortage of, of people to work in that sector right now, and if they don't want to get vaccinated, maybe that's something employers are just going to have to put up with? Well, it, you're right. It's sector by sector, and, and certainly in the, in the service sector, uh, it looks to be that uh, it, employees have, have the upper hand. But at the same time, employers have to be mindful of what's going to keep the workers that are there and who are vaccinated, what are, what, what's going to keep them safe. And so uh, that's why we, we see uh, more and more businesses implementing mandatory vaccination policies. Charlene, I wonder if you could help me understand, because I think you said earlier 80% of your members have been vaccinated, which is great, but 20% have I, have I got that right? It was 80%? Is that the number no, you said? No, no. Actually, we polled our members to see how where they're feeling on the mandatory vaccination in the workplace, and almost 80% supported it. There's almost 96% of frontline workers vaccinated right now. Oh, okay. And that number is, yeah, increasing as the mandate deadlines come okay. to be. Too. Well, 96, even better. But could you maybe help us get inside the heads of the 4% who, who work in healthcare? who work in long-term care settings, perhaps, who therefore 
potentially have more exposure to COVID-19 than the average person and who potentially could expose older people who are the most vulnerable to COVID-19 and dying from it, why would, why would that person not want to get vaccinated under those circumstances? You know, Steve, there's so many reasons, uh, obviously, that they have the hesitancy. Some of them um, in their minds are very legitimate. And they've been, I've had so many conversations where they've been balancing their fear or their beliefs why not to get vaccinated. Uh, they take a look uh, at the other side of the table, what's being offered to them if they do uh, take the vaccine. And some of them are terrified to do it, but they take a look at the working conditions again and some of the uh, respect and protection that they're receiving from their employer, and they're not seeing it worth it. I mean, we're down to about a four to six percent, and we continue because, as we said, the staffing uh, crisis, we want them to be at work. They're not lined up at the doors to take these jobs. But again, it's not just about the vaccine hesitancy. It's, you know, I refer to it as an iceberg. You know, it's a, it's, you see what's above the water, but there's so much below that that is also a part of the reason for not taking the vaccine. Okay, let me do one quick follow-up with you on this, though, because we did have a guest on this program a couple of weeks ago, uh, one of whose parents died in long-term care from COVID-19, and that parent caught COVID-19 from a PSW. So, are, I mean, in your view, are there any circumstances where it's acceptable for a PSW not to be vaccinated? No. Uh, again, there are... Uh ways in which you are exempt, and that is, um, like Ryan said, for medical exemptions. Uh, these workers do understand clearly the consequences of not getting vaccinated, and they are choosing uh, to leave the job, to either be terminated or go on unpaid leave of absence. So it's clear. Again, we do not want one more member or one more senior to die because of this virus, and uh, I agree. If you're not vaccinated and you do not get the exemption, then the consequences are that you don't work in the workplace. Now, they need every uh, uh, fair representation. Uh, you know, like we said, severance. Is there accommodations that can be done? Have they been, you know, adequately educated, had every opportunity to make that decision, understand clearly the consequences? And, you know, in many cases, that's been done. Uh, we will absolutely have members lose their job because they did not get vaccinated. That's unfortunate, but we know the consequences and we want everybody to stay safe. Well, that last answer actually prompted another question from me because you said all of your members, of course, deserve representation. But if one of your members went to the Human Rights Commission saying, I don't want to get the jab for whatever reason, and they didn't have a medical or a religious exemption, would you as their union leader feel obliged to help represent them to make that case to the commission? We've been clear with the frontline workers that uh, likely any challenges to this is uh, not going to be successful. Of course, we are representing them on a you know, one one on one basis, one circumstance issue at a time. So we've been very clear to them that uh, the, it's a mandate. It is uh, it's clear the consequences. We encourage them to get vaccinated. If they choose not to, then there is very little. Uh, that they can do about that. They're making this decision, hopefully, with eyes wide open, and they've had every uh, bit of information put before them. Gotcha. Okay, let's play some tape here. Or I guess it's not really tape. We're not on videotape anymore. We'll roll the server, and we'll get this digital clip to play. That's what I meant to say. Here's Premier Ford last Friday about mandatory vaccine policies in the healthcare sector. Sheldon, if you would. Here in Ontario, many hospitals have implemented mandatory vaccine policies as our government has maintained flexibility for health leaders to do so if appropriate. While some have called for province-wide mandate, any decision to do so needs to be weighed against the real risk of staff shortages that could compromise care. According to recent estimates, 15% of our health system workforce remains unvaccinated putting the magnitude of potential staff losses in the tens of thousands. Okay, Julie, you've heard the conundrum that the provincial government is wrestling with on this issue. Do you think they've made the right call here? Well, I think representing small businesses, the point that I want to raise is the fact that small businesses are shouldered with the responsibility of verifying vaccine credentials already without any help from the government for, for example, funding for smart devices, funding for extra staff, funding for lost business. That's a very important point. And last Friday, 
the government announced that the large businesses like sporting venues would be allowed to cram thousands of people into an arena without physical distancing requirements, yet gyms, restaurants, bars, bowling alleys are limited to certain capacity restrictions, and this is really taking away their ability to generate revenue for months and months of lost business. For example, restaurants in Toronto were closed to indoor dining for 411 days. And what I'm representing now in terms of small business is pushing the Ontario government to immediately level the playing field between big businesses like large sports venues venues and small businesses like gyms and restaurants. Why is it fair? Julie, hang on a sec. I'm, gonna, I, I'm just going to jump in here because uh, I actually want to get to that. We are going to get to that. But you've sort of you've, you've jumped ahead on me a little bit here. And, and I'd really like you to just sort of focus on the question at hand, which is if you're running a small business, as you've pointed out, you are responsible for ensuring that the people who come into that business are appropriately vaccinated. Uh, should should small businesses not have the responsibility to do that? Is that your view? My view is this, and again, CFIB, I stands for independent. It's up to each individual business right now if they choose to put in place a vaccination policy for their employees. It's not mandatory. It's not law by government, unlike the vaccine credentials program, which is law. So it's entirely up to them. And I go back to an earlier point. The fact that it isn't law, and I'm not saying it should be, exposes small businesses to potential human rights and legal challenges because a person can't say, hey, the government made me do this as a small business owner, sue the government if you don't like it. They are exposed. And it is my job as a representative of small business to make sure that any business owner gets the advice that if they choose to put in place a vaccination policy of their employees that they should consult a lawyer first. We don't want to see any businesses faced with challenges. And yes, the business would likely win the challenge, but we don't want them to go under in legal fees before that result would actually come to fruition. So again, this is an extremely touchy issue amongst our membership. They are split on it and it would be inappropriate of me to suggest otherwise that 54% is a majority, but it is certainly not an overwhelming majority. And I have to represent all our members in television programs like this no, one. No, I get you, I get you. And, and you just suggested that uh, if in doubt, consult a lawyer. So that's what I'm gonna do right now. Thankfully, we have Ryan here uh, to consult on this issue. Ryan, this is a conundrum. How do you, what's the way out of it? Well, this is the, the difficulty here. If uh, the, the government does not mandate uh, vaccination policies uh, across businesses, then it is up to the businesses to decide. And then we have a cross mix of different various businesses doing, um, you know, some uh, requiring uh, vaccinations, others don't. And what happens is the public doesn't know, um, you know, who to trust, uh, what business to go to. So, you know, therefore we need a, a, a policy across the board where it's not up to the individual uh, em employer, but rather, um, you know, the government has mandated that vaccinations be required across businesses. That way, um, uh, you know, the, the, the government is, is on the hook for any, any issues and it alleviates some concerns for small businesses. Do you, do you see the government uh, prepared to take that step at the moment? I don't, I don't see them uh, prepared to take that step at all. I think that's why we've seen Premier Ford uh, uh, in a consultation, at least in terms of, of health care, um, to kind of put the onus on, on, on health care uh, organizations to come up with a, a solution. So I don't see it happening anytime soon. Okay, Charlene, let me ask you about healthcare in this circumstance because, uh, and I'm going to hearken back to an example from a couple of weeks ago when the CEO of Hamilton Health Sciences, which is essentially the, the corporation that runs all the hospitals in Hamilton, he did a town hall, a virtual town hall, and he said to all the people who obviously all work in healthcare, he said to them all, if you're having any concerns about getting vaccinated, 
and you still want to show up for work, get over yourself. You have to, period, full stop. Would you sign on to that? Well, again, I, you know, I, I echo what's been said. Uh, it's just been sort of uh, piecemeal, the mandate that's coming out, which has caused massive confusion among all sectors. And speaking about health care, you've got this CEO who took that stand. Uh, you've got others who are a lot more uh, lenient. And, and, and then across sector, again, I'm going to go back to the staffing crisis. You've got this mandate now in long-term care where it says by November 15th, you're vaccinated or you're terminated. Those workers can still work in other sectors of the healthcare system. So, uh, you know, whatever... The premier is going to do on vaccine mandates in all sectors. He has to make it universal across the board. Smaller businesses are being uh, affected in a negative way. So are smaller healthcare uh, uh, organizations and employers as well. The big ones, uh, they might have the ability to say that because their staffing levels might be a little better, but the smaller ones are uh, struggling. Very, uh, so one universal mandate across the system would help uh, healthcare, would help business and small business. Based on your knowledge of your members, in a month's time, when that obligation to be vaccinated for long-term care workers comes in, what percentage of workers do you think will simply leave the sector? There is going to be, I would say right now we're looming around the 4%. Hopefully, you know, that'll be less than to 2%. But, uh, you know, one person leaving the healthcare sector right now can trigger a crisis in that workplace. So I'm hoping that they'll take the time uh, to, again, consider getting the vaccination. We absolutely encourage them to do that. Uh, but hopefully the premier will mandate staffing levels and full-time jobs the same way he did the vaccine mandate, help the crisis out. Well, we did see in other provinces, I think we saw in Quebec and British Columbia, that both those governments sort of backed down a little bit, eased off a little bit. Do you think that's the way Ontario should go in order to deal with this situation? Absolutely. I mean, you take a look at the provinces, which is a really good point. Uh, you've got British Columbia. They uh, implemented a universal wage as early in the pandemic. Again, they, they recognize the crisis in healthcare. Quebec recently stopped enforcing wage restraints because they know that that was driving workers away. We're still struggling with Bill 124 here. And just recently, Saskatchewan uh, ended its relationship with extended care because the for-profit operator has failed a one time too many. So uh, there, is there are examples across the country. Uh, the government could certainly take a look at that and, uh, again, address the staffing crisis. It's really unfortunate, Steve, that, you know, 2% of workers uh, don't uh, show up for whatever reason, can throw the whole system into a crisis. Um, this was foreseeable. The vaccine, I, I, I yes, is affecting the uh, staffing levels. But other issues were uh, the alarm bells were ringing for, you know, a couple of years and if not decades on this. So, uh, yes, other provinces have addressed it. Uh, this, pro this government could certainly uh, learn from their examples. OK, let me circle back now with Julie, because you did want to make the point as you started to earlier. Uh, let's let's deal with this right now. You're quite right. The Scotiabank Arena somehow allows 19, 20,000 people to come in. They all have to prove they've been vaccinated. But there they are, many of them without masks on. Uh, screaming on for the Leafs. We can leave that aside for now. Uh, on the other hand, go to a restaurant, go to a gym, go to a bar. There are still capacity limitations in place. I know you don't like this. Can you talk about what the impact on your members has been of what many are calling a fairly inconsistently uh, approached policy? Well, this is totally unfair. Like, take a gym. They're limited right now to 50% capacity. It's like chopping a business in half, but their bills are still coming in at 100%. And the issue here, Steve, is leveling the playing field. Why is it okay to allow thousands of fans into the Scotiabank Arena with no physical distancing requirements, yet the rules are different for small businesses when they both have to follow strong health and safety protocols and they both screen for vaccine credentials. Why is the lifting of capacity restrictions fast and furious for big businesses like large sporting venues and slow and cautious for small businesses like gyms, restaurants, bars, bowling alleys, dance studios and yoga studios? The government needs to level the playing field now. You know, right you now. no doubt, I know that you and or your uh, other members of your organization have talked to, if not the premier, then certainly senior cabinet ministers about that. And when you put those questions to them, what's the answer you get back? We get no credible answer. I mean, the premier's news conference 
on Friday, he mentioned something about that there was consensus around the table that this sector has strict protocols. So I immediately got tons of phone calls from business owners saying, is the premier saying that my gym doesn't follow health and safety protocols? Does the premier not realize that I also screen for vaccine credentials? And the one thing that's really irritating is they're being told now they have to wait for at least 14 days. And it's a very cavalier approach. It's like suggesting that 14 days is nothing, but you have to have walked a COVID mile in a small business owner's shoes. Hmm. Not just own a business, own a business during a pandemic to understand what they're going through. 37% of Ontario small businesses are at normal revenues right now. The COVID debt, right now is 190,000 per small business and 18% of Ontario small businesses are actively considering bank bankruptcy. Hmm. So any day that you deny them more people entry while being unfair and, and allowing it for big businesses is another missed opportunity for them to start generating revenues that they need in order to survive. Okay, like let me jump in about, here. Forgive yeah. me, Julie, I gotta jump in because I got 30 seconds left and I wanna give it to Ryan. Ryan, in your legal judgment, what's the way out of this mess? Well, that's that's the difficulty, right? Um, uh, the, the way out, I believe, is that um, the government has to mandate uh, mandatory vaccinations. Uh, if not, we're going to have a piecemeal approach, and who suffers the most is the consumer and the and the workers. And so we have to come up with a system where the the the, the, the industry, uh, like the service sector, where we depend on as consumers. They're the ones that are being supported and uplifted. So we got to come up with a better system. Gotcha. Julie, Ryan, Charlene, thanks so much for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your views on this. We're grateful. Thank you, Steve. My pleasure. Thank you. Stay safe. Residential tenants in Ontario have already started to receive notice that their rents are going up. The freeze prompted by COVID-19 is set to expire on January 1st, 2022. We'll hear from both sides of the equation. First up, the tenant perspective. And with us for that, both in the provincial capital, in Weston, Marcia Stone, co-chair of Weston ACORN, a chapter of the national advocacy organization, ACORN Canada. And in Etobicoke, Douglas Kwan, director of advocacy and legal services for the Advocacy Centre for Tenants, Ontario. Good to have you two with us on our program tonight. Let's just do a little background in place for those people who maybe haven't followed this issue all that carefully. Douglas, why was the rent freeze implemented in the first place? It was a response to the pandemic and the economy that um, experienced the, uh, we, Ontario experienced the worst uh, recession since over the last 50 years as a result of the pandemic. A lot of tenant advocates and uh, landlord advocates were calling on real rental support to to, uh, to support them during the pandemic and what we uh, what happened instead was a rent freeze that um, was uh, in place in 2021 where rents would stay frozen uh, for the entire year and did it cover all tenants in the province of Ontario it covered most tenants, but there's also uh, a, a large segment of tenants uh, or tenant situations that are not covered. Uh, vacancy decontrol, where uh, empty units are not subject to rent control, were not impacted by the rent freeze, uh, as well as uh, units that were uh, shared with the landlord, um, where the washroom or kitchen is shared with the landlord, those units were not uh, exempted from the rent control provisions. Okay, so Marcia, bring us up to today now. With the freeze about to expire, what do you think the impact is going to have on the folks that you represent? Unfortunately, since COVID's not over, what, they rent, what I believe that uh, tenants can expect is that they are going to get rent increases that they may not be able to afford. Tenants in uh, buildings before or that are built after November 2018 could have their rent increase by any amount um, because they're not protected. This is why ACORN is out here pushing for an extension of the rent increase, not to mention real rent control 
uh, and a ban on above guideline increases during this pandemic. Uh, people won't have anywhere to go. If they're evicted from their places, they can't afford to live in these apartments. So where are they going to go? What is gonna be the result? You're gonna have people living in the street. You may have more encampments going up. There's people struggling with mental health issues. Uh, people trying to feed their children and their families. They're still out of work. So COVID's not over and the government does not seem to be looking to help the tenants. Uh, you know, it's a stressful time for everybody and especially the low to moderate income people. So you wanna see the freeze extended for how long, for example? I would say that they should extend the freeze to at least a year, you know, after COVID kind of decreases, I guess, and they can see that there is uh, no uptake, but they should leave it at least a year until COVID is over. So people can still recover, you know, they're not recovered in any way, any way shape or form, unfortunately. Now, Marcia, I know there are going to be people watching this and the long list of disastrous things that potentially could happen that you just gave, and they're going to be saying to themselves, boy, she's painting the most awful picture she possibly can paint in order to advocate for the people she represents. So let me ask you, did you over-dramatize that list of potential negative consequences? Uh, no, I didn't, because before pandemic, all this stuff was going on anyway. People were struggling to pay their high cost of rent, putting food on their table, medical aid, internet, you know, internet, daycare, you name it. It's a trickle down, a domino effect, if you want. And uh, no, every, if you look around your communities, pay attention to the news and you see what people are going through. There's no over dramatization of anything. It's a reality for a good percentage of the people that live in this city. Okay, Douglas, let me get you to follow up with this. We know the freeze was, you know, theoretically in place uh, during COVID-19. Could landlords increase the rent anyway, even with the freeze in place? Was there a way to do it? Certainly. Um, they could do so by applying for above guideline rent increases. So if they were, um, they had, uh, invested in their uh, property, they could have uh, passed those costs down to tenants even during the freeze. Uh, as I mentioned, vacancy D control was still in place. So what we were seeing was long-term tenants being evicted during the course of the rent freeze and prior to that uh, uh, through no fault evictions, such as rent evictions, or where the landlord were asking that the, the unit be vacant for their own personal use. Landlords were finding many different ways to uh, to get around the rent freeze uh, during this time so they can maximize uh, a hot real estate market. Now, you just used an expression there that I'm not sure everybody understands. Rent evictions. What's a rent eviction? A rent eviction is where a landlord informs the tenant that they need the unit to be vacant in order to, uh, you know, demolish or convert or renovate a unit. Um, they would inform the tenant that they have a right to return to unit and paying at the same rent. But a lot of times these renovations take three months, six months to a year in, uh, before it's completed. And by that time, most tenants have found a new home and, uh, you know, they don't know the, or are not familiar with the rights to return. And so what happens is that the landlord gets a vacant unit, it's, a, it's in better shape, and they can charge a higher rent as a result. Uh, okay, but I thought the province of Ontario put a, a stay on evictions in place over the past year. Was that not the case? There was a stay on evictions between March to, um, I believe, to May, and then there was another uh, moratorium uh, in the beginning of 2021. But that was really only for the enforcement of eviction orders. The process of, uh, of uh, the landlord tenant board, which is an independent body that hears disputes between landlords and tenants, was still operating from September 2020 up until now. So they were issuing eviction orders uh, almost through the entire uh, period of the pandemic. Understood. Okay, Marcia, I know it's not your job here tonight to represent the views of landlords. I understand that. But landlords are half the equation here, and so I do need to ask you about them. You know, there are mom-and-pop landlords uh, who are having to make payments to the bank in order to make sure 
that they can continue to own their properties. And mm -hmm. uh, as I say, I know it's not your problem to look out for them, but if the freeze continues, some of them may not be able to make those payments and they may lose their properties. Is that a problem that you have to be aware of? Yes, we're aware of the, those situations. Um, but again, um, there's a lot of loopholes out there that landlords are using. The government allows them to use those loopholes and they're using those against their tenant. It's the bottom line is that it's uh, with the contractors and the builders, everybody seems to be on board saying that they're making affordable housing. However, it's not, they're not putting people over profits and that's the problem. People over profits, rich over poor. This is what we deal with on a daily basis. And I'm sure that if you heard some of the individual stories that we get from people that call and attend our chapter meetings, you'd be in shock because landlords get away. They have the upper hand. They have all the control. If they don't want you in their place, like he said, you can use rent evictions or they won't do the repairs in the building so that you will either move out or they'll try to pay you off minimum money to relocate. But the question is, where are people relocating to? There's no affordable housing here in Ontario. So that's why I said there's going to be encampments. If the landlords would work and the landlord associations and the city would sit down and work with the people, then maybe we would have some kind of progress. But as it is stands now, it's people over profits. Now, I appreciate Profit your position. Over people. I, Sorry. I, I understand. I appreciate your position on this. But uh, Douglas, you know, let me let me ask you this. A at some point, the freeze has to come off, right? The freeze can't last forever. And let's just look at a couple of facts. 85% of the people in the province of Ontario are vaccinated now. Um, all of the jobs that were lost during the course of the pandemic, we are told, have come back. So if now is not the time to take the freeze off, when's a better time? Well, we're supportive of the freeze, absolutely. But we, we've we always advocated for actual rent relief as well. These are direct rent relief supports for tenants to help them get out of the hole that they find themselves in uh, because of the rent arrears that have accumulated ever since March of 2020. We're asking that the government close the loopholes for control because we believe that that will support tenants uh, and ensure that affordable housing is available to them. It's a, it's a very challenging time. And certainly, if you're looking for a specific timeline, I can't give that to you. Uh, just keep in mind that although the economy is returning, we're still in our fourth wave. Those who have had rent arrears accumulate, even if they found the same job paying at the same rate that they once did, they'll have to find a higher paying job to cover those rent arrears that, uh, that have accumulated in the past. So is renters find themselves in a very challenging situation, uh, especially uh, when you look at the minimum wage rising by only 10 cents and the rent increase next year rising by 1.2%. And the costs of inflation is going up as well. Um, as well, you know, 35% uh, of, uh, of tenants uh, earn less than $30,000 a year, and that was in 2016. The situation hasn't improved for them. Mm -hmm. So really, they, they were already in a challenging time prior to the pandemic, and the pandemic has only made things worse. Well, let me get Marcia to comment on that, because obviously we're not too worried here about people who are paying seven, eight, nine thousand dollars $9,000 a month in rent. Um, they're doing fine, they can afford it. But the low-income tenants, the people who are in real trouble, Marcia, besides a six-month extension on the rent freeze, what do you think the province of Ontario could be doing to help those folks? It's, it's a, you know, like he said, it's very challenging and trying to come up with ideas um, constantly, because remember, CRB is going to be running over for people as well this month you know in the next week or so so now you've got it even more you know compounded uh, a compounded issue um you know work with the people and come up with a plan that's beneficial to the people talk to the people that are being affected by this homelessness and 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 um the stress of trying to maneuver throughout this pandemic um rents anywhere is from two thousand dollars up it's ridiculous. People on fixed incomes are struggling. 
I, as a pensioner, have to, you know, have to struggle. And it, 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 it doesn't seem like they want, the government wants to sit down and talk to the people. They want to make decisions for the people without any kind of consultant. And if you're not above a certain income bracket, they don't want to hear from you. And, you know, this is why we say your postal code should not determine the quality of service that you get. And it's, I see it more and more every single day, and it really, really upsets me. Um, I think the government, which are the elected officials that we put in place, need to start talking to the people and working with the people. Because remember, there'll be an election coming soon, and they'll be knocking on your door wanting your vote. <laughs> That's June 2nd, it's 2022. Yes, you are right. Exactly. That's, it's exactly. on the calendar, but, and it's out there. And the other thing is they keep, they keep, doing studies i mean you know we bring kind of ideas and solutions to city council and the premier and whatever however if you're not trying to um help the people you keep um prolonging these studies okay we're going to do this in 2000 people need help now this is 2021 22 we need help now not in the next year not in two years from now you still need a place to live and if the government doesn't want to help the people, what are people going to do? You're going to have people out there, um, you know, uh, in dire states, in dire straits. That's Marcia Stone from Weston Acorn and Douglas Kwan from the Advocacy Centre for Tenants Ontario. I thank both of you for coming out of TVO tonight and sharing your views. Much appreciated. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Steve. Me. And with us now for the landlord perspective in Orangeville, Ontario, Booba Ba. He is chair of Solo, the Small Ownership Landlords Ontario. And in the provincial capital, Tony Irwin, president and CEO of the Federation of Rental Housing Providers of Ontario. And it's good to have you two with us tonight here on TVO. Tony, start us off here. How has the last year or so been for your members, given that a freeze has been in place? Well, Steve, I think the last year has been obviously very difficult for everyone, uh, for residents and for those who provide housing. Um, since the beginning of the pandemic, we, I think, have all done our part to try to work together to get through what has been obviously uh, something that none of us have any experience with has been extremely uh, challenging and difficult. But we have you know, listened to uh, calls from all political leaders uh, to, to do our part and to help those who have been truly uh, disadvantaged and had hardship during the pandemic. That said, there are rental housing providers who have had challenges also. Uh, and so we, we hear from members who say, you know, we understand that there are many uh, Ontarians who are struggling. We are struggling too. Uh, and so we also uh, are, are doing our best as rental housing providers to get through. So it's been uh, uneven for everyone. Um, admittedly, there are, you know, there are bright spots. Uh, the vast majority of rent has been paid uh, during the pandemic, which we think is, is, is great. But it doesn't mean there haven't been challenges for many. Uh, and our members certainly have done their part to try to help get them through that. And that's really what the last year has looked like. And we're all just hoping for better days. We think we're starting to see it. Um, but it has been difficult for many to get through this last year. There's no doubt about that. Well, we just heard about some of the challenges that tenants have had. And now I want to find out some of the challenges that landlords have had. And Buba, I'll ask you about that. How were the people that you represent, how were the landlords able to, uh, for example, pay for things like repairs or renovations? when there was a rent freeze in place. Okay, thank you. Uh, for small landlord, you're talking about people who have like a few property, like uh, renting your basement, having a duplex. Unlike uh, the big landlord, most of their income comes from uh, rental. The fact there has been a rent freeze made the, the their, uh, position very, very difficult. I'm explaining why. Uh, there have been a rent freeze for 2021, and everything went up. You're talking about uh, gas that went up, uh, maintenance went up, uh, uh, labor went up. Still, the rent become the same. So what happened to the small landlord is uh, they are losing basically 50 to 100 percent of uh, their income if uh, there is uh, no rent payment. The rent freeze has been uh, very bad, but. Uh, some of the landlord managed to use uh, their uh, line of credit, go into the further debt in order to keep uh, to maintain uh, the property because by law they are obligated to maintain the property. So just to confirm then, do you know of any landlords that you represented who said, I, I, I just can't do this anymore because of the rent freeze, I'm going to have to give up my property? 
We got uh, uh, at least uh, anecdotally, we have at least dozen of uh, landlords who get out of the, the, the rental business. It's uh, just a uh, simple math. If you can't, uh, if your income doesn't cover your cost, uh, you can go for a while. But after after a while, you would just have to make a decision. Yeah, small landlords are getting out of uh, the rental business. Yes. Okay, Tony. Having said that, though. There, I mean, yes, the freeze was in place, but there were ways to apply for special exemptions in order to raise the rent for a variety of reasons. Landlords did take advantage of that, yes? There are some certainly who did, Steve, uh, but there are also many who did not. So you are right, above guideline increases were still available in certain circumstances, uh, and some uh, rental housing providers did uh, go forward uh, with that work that needed to be done uh, and did go to the landlord tenant board to apply for that increase. But there are many others who simply have not. Uh, they, have, they have really sort of hunkered down and, and focused on what's most important uh, during the pandemic, the enhanced cleaning protocols, keeping their residents and staff safe, and they've elected not to proceed with some of those uh, repairs and upgrades right now simply because it wasn't, uh, it, you know, just didn't make sense. Uh, it, it were more, there were more pressing priorities that were needed to be looked after uh, than, than some of those. And I'll ask you the same question I just asked Buba, which is, do you know of any people who just said, you know, what the hell with this? This is too tough a way to make a living and I'm getting out. Uh, you know what? I don't know that I've heard of any who have absolutely gotten out uh, simply expressly because of the pandemic. I've heard many stories of our housing providers who have said over the last a year maybe this was the the tipping point maybe this is what i said you know what this is this is the end uh but there were maybe other factors that contributed to it leading up to the pandemic difficulties uh in in collecting rent and and just trouble uh being able to provide housing uh there's no doubt that this certainly put some of them over the top and said i'm out i, I simply can't do this anymore okay buba have the landlords that you represent received any government assistance to help them over the past year no nothing at all Nothing at all. There was no specific program designed for small landlord. If you're a corporate landlord, you can apply for you know some business support. As an individual landlord, somebody's renting the basement, the triplex or the duplex, there have been not a single program designed specifically for, for those people. Did you think there should have been? Actually, we did ask uh, the provincial government to, to put us uh, in uh, in the same level playing field than anybody else. And uh, so far, we haven't uh, received any response. If you are unemployed, you receive serve. If uh, you are a business, let's say you have a big, you are a big corporate landlord, you have uh, employees, you get some type of subsidy. If you're a commercial landlord, you got a program specifically designed for them. It's called, I forget what's the name. And uh, the artist, uh, the, uh, the farmer, the Everybody basically got uh, a specific uh, program that was tailored to their need. The small landlords were the only group that has been forced to bear the cost of housing people for free during the pandemic. And that's not right. Okay, Tony, let me follow up with this. Uh, sure. You know, we appreciate the fact that the past year has been difficult on everybody, including landlords. Uh, I think Bubo gave us a list a moment ago of uh, the fact that air conditioning costs or heating costs, whatever, would have gone up. Insurance rates would have mm -hmm. gone up. I mean, there's a whole bunch of expenses that you guys would have had to deal with. There was a property tax holiday for a little while for municipalities, which no doubt helped the bottom line a little bit. Uh, on balance, how did landlords, in your view, get through the past year? I think on balance, they got through by making some difficult choices, as we talked about, uh, deferring uh, some projects that uh, certainly, certainly cert that could not be uh, advanced, uh, couldn't be moved forward on at this time. Uh, you know, I think it was uh, really trying to uh, get through, help the residents who were not able to pay rent uh, with those who were paying. Uh, and, but really, Steve, at the end of the day, there are, um, you know, some of them have been able to get through more easily than others. It's not been an even journey for all. And as Buba talked about, uh, certainly for many smaller landlords, the journey has been very difficult. Uh, those who are larger, who have scale, uh, perhaps have been able to get through a little bit uh, more easily, but they've had to make choices. If our family budget's impacted, something happens uh, to, to your spouse or to you and your employment, you have to make some, some choices. And they're not always easy choices to make. But what didn't get compromised was safety, uh, the, you know, the building integrity, things that needed to happen to keep building safe and keep them running, uh, those did not get compromised on. Other things that maybe could wait are waiting and have waited uh, to such time that they can, you know, the, the conditions uh, recover more and those improvements are able to get made. But 
it's like any business, any family, when you're faced, when you face adversity, you have to make difficult choices sometimes. Uh, and that's certainly what many landlords have had to do uh, to be able to get through this. Now, Bubo, one of the reasons that this is such a complicated issue that's always fraught with challenges is that, I mean, you guys are not really selling a normal product. You're selling somebody's home. Now, they don't own it, but still, it's home for them. And I wonder how much sympathy you have for, for example, low-income tenants who, you know, don't want to be evicted, obviously, in the middle of a global pandemic, and who have challenges of their own trying to pay the bills and take care of everything. Uh, I know you've got difficulties, but how much sympathy did you have for the tenants? Big sympathy. Um, nobody, no small landlord wants to evict a tenant. Because evicting a tenant basically meaning a loss of uh, income, and to find a new tenant, it's going to go through a process during which you don't collect uh, any rent. And uh, let's uh, make it clear, the majority of uh, the tenants are law-abiding citizens who basically pay the rent or make an effort to pay the rent. Our problem is the system, the way it's designed right now, unscrupulous tenants who play the system and refuse, are able, I just have to insist that they are able, but they refuse to pay, and there is no consequence for them. How much of that Case went on, one. Buba? Uh, we did a survey within our, uh, our uh, organization. I can tell you maybe one to 3% of our membership, which is a very small uh, windows of uh, landlords uh, in Ontario have faced uh, a, what we call difficult tenant. Tenant who collect CERB, who collect uh, from the rent bank and refuse, refuse. I'm not, uh, you know, uh, they basically, it's not like uh, they are struggling. They refuse to pay even a partial payment. But and I guess I'm wondering, I mean, is that, is that a widespread phenomenon or that would just be a handful of people? This is like uh, a car accident. You know, uh, you got, uh, you know, people are riding their car, no accident happened. But once it happened to one person, that becomes a, a huge issue for the whole community. Personally, as a small landlord, I never have any issue for my tenants. So now hearing the other people, their issue for what we call professional tenants, I realize it can happen to anybody. So what we are asking is the system to be fair. So people who are able to pay the rent and refuse to pay the rent, and the system allows them to, you know, to not to pay the rent, that should be addressed. Otherwise, what's going to happen? People are going to be very reluctant to rent because, hey, I don't want to end up with uh, somebody who refused to pay the rent and there's nothing I can do about it. And yes, we do have a sympathy. Like we, if somebody can pay, you sit down together, you talk to your uh, to your tenant. Hey, I can pay. I will pay maybe fifty percent uh, today, or you know, I can pay. Uh, can we break the lease? That happen all the time. But we're talking about a small minority of uh, of uh, people who refuse and been encouraged by groups that are all over the social media. And it started with the premier, who basically tell them in uh, March 2020, if you can't pay your rent, pay, uh, do not pay your rent. Right, okay, L uh, you mentioned the system there, and I, I wanna ask Tony in our last couple of minutes sure. about that, because there is sure. this thing yeah. called the Landlord and Tenant Board, which has yeah. obviously oversight responsibilities in this area. What kind of mm -hmm. changes would you like to see to the way it works that you think would make things work better? Well, you know, Steve, I mean, we, as Bubba was, was talking about uh, when he was speaking, uh, certainly we were, our view was, uh, in our conversations with government, were about keeping the board open. And we know there were obviously periods of time where uh, there was a, a moratorium on evictions. We understood that, but our message always to government was: uh, we need to get the board open. It is the, uh, as you as you said, Steve, it is the uh, the place for uh, landlords and tenants to go to have the disputes adjudicated. It's important for access to justice, and it needs to be available and open. And it is, and it has been now for some time. And we think that's uh, good for both sides. Uh, in terms of the system itself. Uh, the government's done a great job at hiring more adjudicators. Uh, that was a, a huge need uh, for, for more. Uh, get them trained up and get them actually working. That's been, uh, is certainly greatly improved uh, over just a few years ago. Uh, there still are big time delays. It still takes a very long time uh, to get to, from the time the hearing is scheduled to actually getting in front of an adjudicator to then getting a, uh, a ruling and, and getting that ruling uh, issued. Uh, it's, there still are huge time delays. It's gotten a lot better. Uh, but it could be better. It could it could be better still. Uh, you know, it, it's not beneficial to either side to have to wait for an inordinate period of time.
to have a hearing and then have a judgment uh, issued by an adjudicator. So the one thing I would say is just trying to make the system a little more efficient. And, you know, with anyone, anything uh, like this where you're hiring new adjudicators, getting them trained up, getting them working, it does take time. There's a ramp up period. And so I think we'll just continue to see that improve. And, and as, as I said, I think that's beneficial for all parties. And Tony, in our last 20 seconds here, of course, when the freeze comes off at the beginning of next year, landlords are not obliged to increase the rent. But do you suspect 100 percent of them will? I, I would suspect that a great a great uh, number will, uh, Steve. I mean, it's been uh, since 2019 for for many uh, since many tenants have had a rent increase. Uh, the increase, I think, is is uh, uh, pretty uh, modest at 1.2 percent. Uh, I think the vast majority of tenants will be able to to make that uh, that rent increase payment without uh, difficulty. And for those who cannot, who are still being challenged by the pandemic and still uh, have uh, have hardship. Uh, we will continue to work with those residents. Uh, we don't want to see people evicted either. I know that may, uh, some may not believe me when I say that, but we simply do not. We want to work with those who have made efforts to pay, who have, have done their very best to contribute whatever rent amount they can during the pandemic. And if they're still having trouble because of the pandemic, we will be there to help and do all that we can. Uh, and that's, I think, how we will get through this all together. Tony Irwin and Booba Ba, we thank you for joining us on TVO tonight and sharing your views. Much appreciated. Thanks, Steve. Great to be with you. And that is the agenda for Monday, October 18th, 2021. With Queen's Park back in session, the unmistakable scent of an election year seems to be in the air. Tomorrow, we'll pick up the trail. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pagan is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.